All right, chapter three, which is all <clears throat> about water, which is a very important compound for living things, because as we said in the last chapter, um, living things are mostly made of water, and our surroundings have a lot of water in them. Um, unless, of course, you're in certain parts of California right now where it's quite dry. Um, so, as we saw, water, this compound, it's a uh, molecule which is polar covalent. Again, the oxygen is more electronegative than the hydrogen, so the oxygen side of the molecule has a slight negative charge. The hydrogen sides have a slight positive side, so water molecules will form hydrogen bonds. Essentially, these molecules, you might say, are, are, are sticky. Um, and so, here's an interesting, is this a likely arrangement for two water molecules? Huh. Huh, think about that one. Um, so essentially, water molecules stick to each other. Um, in its liquid state, these hydrogen bonds are constantly breaking and forming between adjacent water molecules. So the water molecules are moving around, but they will temporarily, very briefly, bond with each other, but then move on to the next water molecule. Um, so this gives water, mo uh, water a lot of uh, interesting and useful and uh, what you might call emergent properties, um, properties that emerge from the bonding of hydrogens and oxygens between each other and then the interaction of the different molecules with each other. For example, um, water molecules, when they are sticking to each other, we call this cohesion. They stick to each other because the molecules are sticky, and they adhere, or you have adhesion, to other surfaces that have a charge. So, for example, in this tree here, you have these uh, vessels, these xylem vessels, we'll learn about those much later, um, that are pathways in which water can move up the tree. And so as the water is moving up the tree, the water molecules are sticking to each other, sort of forming a network that's being sort of pulled up the tree. And the water molecules will temporarily stick to the sides of the xylem vessels. And this helps to keep the water from sort of flowing backwards. It's, it sticks to the sides of the, of the, of the tube, the xylem vessels. Um, so cohesion and adhesion, um, when water forms a bead of liquid on, on um, your glass, for example, your windshield or your car, again, the, the water molecules are sticking to each other, but they're also sticking to the glass, which allows it to sort of sit there suspended at that 45 degree angle, whatever it is the windshield is at. Um, okay, so the stickiness the cohesion of water molecules to each other also allows for this phenomenon, this spider here um, that's able to float or walk on top of the water. And we know that as surface tension. It's analogous to being on a trampoline. You, you push down the trampoline, but you don't break it. And that's the same with this spider here. Its, its feet are pushing down on the water. Because the water molecules are sticking to each other, the bonds are not broken. It just kind of pushes them down. Now, obviously, if something is, is heavy enough, it will break the surface tension and go through the water. And of course, we can't walk on water because we're much too heavy and our feet are much too small. So we break the surface tension. But if it's light enough, it doesn't break the surface tension. Um, Okay, water also has, of course, well, all substances, all materials have a, what you would call, specific heat, and that is essentially how much heat that molecule can absorb. Water, co compared to other compounds, other, other elements, or other uh, molecules, has a rather high specific heat. That is, it takes a lot of energy, a lot of heat, to change the temperature of water. 
or in other words, water is able to absorb a lot of heat. Okay. And as we learn in the ecology class, this has a big impact on climate. Um, essentially large, any body of water, particularly large bodies of water like the ocean, can absorb lots of heat, okay? Um, and so you notice when you look at the temperatures here along the coast of California, you'll see a, a right along the coast in this particular time and day, the temperatures are much lower than further in. That's because the water is essentially absorbing a lot of the heat which keeps the air temperature cooler. Whereas when you go further inland, there's much less water. And in fact, if you go to these other places, you're basically in the desert and there's not much water at all. The land and the air heat up much faster and get to a much higher temperature because there isn't water around to absorb that heat. Um, now on the other side of the coin, at night, what will happen is Further in, in the desert, again, there's very little water around, there's very little humidity. That heat will rapidly escape up into the atmosphere, and the evening and nighttime temperatures will get relatively cool in the desert, whereas at the coast, what happens is at night, when the land has begun to cool down, the ocean will begin to give off the excess heat or the heat that is absorbed during the day. And so essentially at the coast, it never gets super hot or really cool because the water has this moderating effect. Whereas inland in the desert, it's really hot during the day and relatively cool at night. And you'll have much more extremes. Now for us, more immediately, this has a big impact because Essentially, our bodies consist largely of water, and so it takes time for our body to heat up and to cool down, which is a good thing because we like to keep our body temperature relatively constant. So you can walk outside on a cool day. Um, let's say it's in the middle of winter and you're just going to go outside and grab the newspaper or something like that. You might still have your pajamas on, and it feels cool, of course, but it's not like your body all of a sudden cools down. All that water is holding on to the heat. Um, and the same thing when you walk into a sauna. It's not like your body all of a sudden just heats up to, you know, uh, if you go uh, to 150 degrees or whatever it is, because it takes time for your body temperature to change. That high specific heat. You see this as well um, when you cook something on a stove. You get a pan of water, you're going to cook some pasta, you start heating it up the metal pan gets hot really fast because that iron uh, essentially has a low specific heat. It heats up really fast, whereas the water takes time. Um, all right, so another interesting thing. Um, now, as things cool down, the atoms comprising that material will start to move slower. They tend to get a little closer together, and the material becomes more dense. It becomes heavier per unit area. And water does the same thing. As it gets cooler, it starts to get more and more dense. And in fact, it's at its most dense at approximately 4 degrees Celsius, not quite the freezing point. But when it starts to get cooler and cooler down to 3 to one and then finally zero degrees when it freezes it actually begins to expand and so this solid water ice is less dense than the liquid form because of all those those hydrogen bonds have essentially become locked in place and the water molecules are further apart from each other than in the liquid form and thus ice floats which is important for organisms that live in cold climates um, that the ice forms on top of the lake and not further down, and the things can continue to, down to live below the ice where you have liquid water. Um, again, that's a relative, that's a unique thing about water, the fact that the solid form is less dense than the liquid form. Water is, of course, a good sol oops, solvent. And when you mix things in to it, not everything, of course, but many things will essentially dissolve in the water. So you mix salt 
and the ions in the salt begin to break apart and bond with the water molecules. And you mix sugar in water and it'll dissolve. Um, now, of course, um, um, things like oil, as we know, do not mix because oil fats, oils, those things do not have a charge, and so they will not bond with water, so therefore they will not dissolve in water. So things have to have a charge in order to dissolve in water. All right, um, pH, or the hydrogen ion concentration of water. So here's two water molecules, and if you've got a large you know, container full of water, or even a small one for that matter, what happens to some of those water molecules? Well, they dissociate. That is, they break apart. And that is, a molecule will lose a hydrogen ion and become a hydroxide ion. Another one will gain a hydrogen and become a hydronium ion, a positive ion. And so in any container, any solution with water in it, you've got lots of H2Os, but you have some hydronium and some hydroxide ions in that solution. Now, when you just have pure water, the positive ion, the hydronium, will be equal to the negative hydrogen uh, hi ion, and you essentially have neutral or a pH of 7. However, if we add an acid to the solution, it will become acidic and it will have more of the hydronium and less of the hydroxide. If you add a base to the solution, you'll have more of the hydroxide and less of the hydronium, and that's greater than 7. So if we add HCl, hydrochloric acid, what happens? It breaks into its ions. You have more H pluses, which will bond with some water molecules to form, that's supposed to be a 3, the hydronium ion, and so it's going to be greater than your hydroxide, and you have an acid. Um, the, the chloride ion has no effect on, on the pH. When we add potassium hydroxide, we get the potassium ion, no effect, but now we've got this hydroxide ion, and now our hydroxide ion will be greater than our hydronium, and we have a base. All right. What does it mean to add a buffer to a solution? Well, if you've got a, a basic solution and you want to buffer that solution, you're essentially going to add an acid and you're bringing it back toward neutrality. If you're going to buffer an acidic solution, you have to add a base because you're bringing it back towards neutrality. Anytime you're buffering a solution, you're attempting to bring it closer to or to neutrality. And so it's all relative as to what you have to add to buffer that solution. All right, ecologically speaking, of course in us, um, we'll talk about our blood much later, and um, buffering the blood is very important. Your, your blood likes to be around neutral and not much further off than that, so that's a big deal in us. But in the wider environment, um, you've probably heard of this phenomenon of ocean acidification. And what that's all about is that as the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere is increasing, essentially the ocean will absorb some of that CO2. When it does, it'll react with water. It forms carbonic acid. Some of those carbonic acid molecules will break apart. Um, and you get your excess H pluses, which is thus why it's an acid. Um, some of those hydrogen ions will react with um, this CO3 that's in the water to form more carbonic acid. That molecule will normally react with calcium to form calcium carbonate. Calcium carbonate is what organisms that have a shell use to build their shells. But when you have more CO2, you have less calcium carbonate around, which is stressful for these organisms, and that's a problem. All right, I've run out of time. We'll talk about it more in class. Bye.